Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring the retrospective for Whitaker versus Till and the fight picks for Brunson versus Shabazian. Looking back to this contest on Saturday, we ended up getting the main event incorrect, but we did come in at 60% accurate overall, going 9-6 and six for the Whitaker versus Till card. So not a bad performance, not quite as good as we were last week at 75% but still above 50%, and the Patreons were also good as well coming in the money. So, let's get into it. Here's the show. All right, so let's talk about the main event. So, we had Bobby Knuckles defeat the Gorilla in this main event contest. So this one here was pretty close, but mostly Whitaker ended up in cruise control after the second round knee stomp that seemed to, according to Till, blow out his knee. Will he need surgery? Remains to be seen. Uh, it's the same sort of thing that he basically did to Stephen Wonderboy Thompson in their outing where Pitt, where Till took took a took a victory. Uh, so in that one, you know, I know we called Till. If his knee doesn't get blown out, it certainly does change his striking. It changes the way the fight plays out. We saw Till being very effective in the first round, and then it was a decline really after the stomp, and that really screwed up his game. You know, I, I think Till wasn't there to make a lot of excuses in the post fight, so he wasn't going to blame it all on that. Uh, but as a, you know, no, you know, I got no stake in the game as Till, and I think it certainly did affect him. I think having your knee, having your movement destroyed, your ability to pivot, your ability to you know, kind of brace yourself to land power shots. Um, everything is going to be compromised without your knee being there at 100% or, you know, as close to 100% as a fighter can have it be. And so I think that's ultimately what turned the tail here, what turned the side. Uh, Till looked very good. He's a very competent striker we saw. Uh, but, uh, you know, like I said earlier in my last podcast, uh, Whitaker is the more well-rounded MMA guy. I just didn't think he was going to win, but uh, he proved me wrong, proved that his versatility is what led to his pathways to victory. He was much better on the mat. He proved to be very effective on the feet, uh, landing some, uh, or throwing a lot of power shots. I think Till actually landed a few additional power shots himself, but either way, Whitaker strikes him 49 to 41 and scores two takedowns, so it's kind of all she wrote, unanimous decision for Robert Whitaker, and uh, hey, I love Bobby Knuckles, so I'm not sad to see it, but uh, I would have liked to have gotten it right, just is what it is. And the next one, Mauricio Hua defeats uh, Rogerio Noguera. Great fight, you know, th- it's a throwback fight for sure. These guys have fought three times now. Uh, Hua has won all three of them, so I think he certainly uh, sort of puts a stamp on this one as part of his career. Noguera is never able to grab the brass ring against Hua, and it ends up being a really solid MMA fight. I mean, these guys are of advanced age, uh, but they certainly brought a lot of excitement, and uh, it was a phenomenal win for Hua, who got a split decision victory. And got the fight correct for us. Uh, these next couple ones here, we did get incorrect. Uh, so I was really strong in the first part of the show, and then things sort of tumbled a bit towards the end. Fabricio Verdum sort of tragically defeats Alexander Gustafsson. Uh, the hardest thing in the world must be to be a Gustafsson fan. You know, you're out in Sweden, you're maybe somewhere in Scandinavia, you're just anywhere in the world, and you like to see the Mahler put on a show. And besides his fight with John Jones, uh, you know, Glover Teixeira, a couple out there. I mean, this guy has really had some disappointing outings. You know, we had this Verdum loss with the arm bar and two minutes and 30 seconds into the first round. You have the knockout by Rumble Johnson in his home country. Uh, th- this guy's got a lot of tragedy as a competitor. Now, when I say tragedy, I mean it truly in the sports sense. You know, he, he doesn't live the, a tragic life to the best of my knowledge but uh, every time he stepped in on a big stage and this was a pretty big stage going up against a former heavyweight champion a guy would be Fedor Emelianenko in his prime he defeated uh you know Cain Velasquez not sea level Cain Velasquez mind you but Cain Velasquez nevertheless and uh so he, he had a lot I think to gain by proving he could hang at heavyweight I don't know what's next for Gus after this one um you know he's gone back and forth to retirement so it'll be interesting to see what he does um but I would love to see the Mauler either go out and, and go away or you know only come back if he's actually ready and you know I assume he was ready just things just didn't work out like uh like I think we all wanted them to yeah we all wanted to see Gus get a win I, I think that was pretty hard and clear anyways we get that one wrong uh, but realistically I'm just a little sad to see Gus single out in a shield like that 
The next one we got incorrect, but it was a very close fight. Uh, Carla Esparza defeats Mariana Rodriguez. Interesting fight, tough to call. Esparza obviously scoring all the takedowns. Uh, Mariana scoring all the big heavy strikes. And even though it was a split decision, you know, for Esparza, I think in some ways you could have given it to Rodriguez. You know, Esparza had the control. She had the takedowns. She was doing some damage on the ground, uh, but there was some great elbows from the bottom for Rodriguez. She managed to get back to her feet for most of the fight. She landed a lot of great strikes in the stand-up game. Uh, and then the damage. So for me, I think the damage sort of leans towards Rodriguez. However, it's hard to ignore five takedowns. And so, you know, the judges have to make a decision. They went with Esparza. I don't entirely disagree with that decision. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to be too upset about it. We got it incorrect, uh, but it was a very, very tight contest. And Esparza proves that she definitely belongs in this Lady Strawway division. She is on now a five-fight winning streak, if I'm not mistaken. Let's go look this up real quick. Four-fight winning streak. Her last loss was in 2018 to Tatiana Suarez, so she is fighting her way back up the ladder for sure. And the next one, one that uh, we got cor incorrect, but uh, I really like to see this guy fight. We got Paul the Bear Jew Craig defeating Gazmarad and Tikalov. And in this one, you know, I think Craig ta uh, taunted uh, a Antikolov a bit, kind of got him to throw down really early. He uh, Antikolov goes for a single leg. And Craig uh, just kind of goes, oh, no, you got me in a single. I'm about to go to work on you, son. And he throws up a triangle. I mean, it's not instantaneous from when he first goes down, but he showed how good he is on the ground and sort of took advantage of a guy that was being a little overly aggressive and a little bit doubtful of what Craig could do to him on the ground from his back. So Craig shows that his Brazilian jiu-jitsu is sharp as ever and that triangle as deadly as ever with the Bear Jew picking up a solid, solid victory in uh, Las Vegas. Actually, no, Abu Dhabi. This was the last contest in Fight Island, or last card, as it were. So, again, incorrect for us, but uh, I still like to see Paul Craig fight and win. In the next one, we did get correct. Alex Oliveira defeats Peter Sabota. Solid fight. Uh, Oliveira outstrikes him almost 2-1. to one. Um, Just has the advantage over Sabota the entire time. Basically, uh, beats him up on the feet and throws a lot of front kicks, uh, just stabbing at the solar plexus of Sabota. I'm sure his chest and uh, abs were sore after that one. In the next one, uh, Kazmat Chimev, uh, Chimev, I gotta get his name right because this guy's gonna be a star. Uh, at least it looks like he's gonna be right now. Uh, he picks up Rise McKee, carries him to his corner, dumps him on his back, and just goes to work on him for three minutes. Um, there's really not much else to say. This guy scores 40 strikes, one takedown, doesn't receive a single strike, um, just, you know, destroys Rise McKee. It'll be interesting to see what happens when he fights real competition. You know, and nothing against Rise, but he's a very early young prospect, and clearly Kazmat's a, a cut above these guys at the you know assumed level he should be at. Uh, so it'll be interesting once he starts knocking on the door of ranked opponents. And I have a feeling he's probably, if he wants to be as active as he is, he's probably going to get a fast track to those big names. Uh, he already started UFC, sorry ESPN promo. Uh, for this guy, you know, touting him as 7-0 and and yada yada. So uh, this guy is being given uh, the 175, 100, sorry, 170 pound fast track. He's even talking about winning titles, the 185 pound division going down. I mean, he's got big grandiose ideas right now. Uh, but let's see what happens when he gets better competition. And uh, we'll see how things play out. But we got that one correct. And uh, the guy is looking like a wrecking machine, so I have no reason to doubt him at this point. Uh, moving on to the next one, Francisco Trinaldo defeats Yai Herbert. Uh, so Herbert uh, was doing okay. Uh, he was outstruck 21-30. to 30. He was also taken down. He's probably going to lose the fight, honestly, by decision. Uh, but uh, fairly early on in the third round, he catches a really nasty shot, uh, basically goes out on his feet. Um, this is actually what inspired uh, all the things you've been seeing on Twitter, the MMA you know, kind of social media world with Herb Dean and Dan Hardy going at it. Uh, I think that um, Trinaldo may have, you know, landed a few extra punches, uh, you know, without Dean calling it a little bit earlier. You could see that Herbert was basically out on his feet, out when he hit the mat, and probably should have been waved off just a second earlier. It's a very razor-thin margin, I think, you want to see if um, Herbert was going to come to, and that obviously didn't happen. So uh, he let him go out and shield a little bit in there, and I, I, I don't feel the way Greg Hardy, sorry, Greg Hardy, Dan Hardy felt about it, um, but I do think that, uh, you know, you don't want to let a guy take unnecessary shots. It's just bad for their career. It's bad for their health. And uh, in a violent sport, it's still a sport, and we got to kind of control things more so than, you know, the violence or the 
fighting itself would dictate. Anyways, we get that one incorrect. And next one we did get correct. Uh, no, no, sorry. This one, uh, this one we got incorrect as well. We had a, like I said, we had a run of bad calls here. Uh, Jesse Ronson defeats Nicholas Dalby. Uh, so Dalby looked great. He was, uh, you know, landing good shots. He was really coming after Ronson, even though Ronson was and- landing a lot of counter shots himself and ended up outstriking Dalby. Uh, ends up scoring, picking up a rear naked choke and uh, kind of submitting the more aggressive guy. This was uh, almost like a Paul Craig situation. You know, Ronson uh, bided his time dealt with the bigger, more powerful uh, Dolby very well, ended up picking up a solid, solid victory, and uh, one we got incorrect. Uh, we move into a lot of correct ones here on out, though. Uh, Tom Asimov defeats Jake Collier. Collier looked terrible. I mean, this guy used to fight at 170 pounds. He's like now 250 pounds. He, he didn't look confident even standing in the images. I, I don't know where the hell they got this guy. Um, he must have been on the couch, is my best assumption. And uh, he threw a couple punches, got knocked out. In the first round, I guess he got a paycheck. Um, but Espinal gets a win, and, I mean, it must have been hard to get the guy an opponent, I guess. And just kind of sad to see Collier uh, out there, like 250 pounds. A guy that used to fight you know, almost 100 pounds less. Anyways, most far, Avalov defeats Mike Grundy, another one we get correct. Uh, Grundy uh, does score a lot of takedowns, but has really no damage, no striking game, and is outstruck about 4-1. to one. Uh, So they ended up giving that one to Evilov because the six takedowns just were not able to uh, sustain any control over Evilov. Evilov. I keep on Evilov, but uh, Evilov. The next one, Tanner Bozo defeats Rafael Pessoa. Second round, uh, he catches him with like a punch to the eye almost. It was definitely a a fair, even, you know, fair strike thrown. It wasn't illegal or anything, but he hits him in the eye. Uh, Pessoa kind of goes down. Uh, Bozer hits him with a couple more shots late, uh, sorry, mid in the second round and picks up a solid win. Uh, I called it. I'm happy to see uh, Bozer picking up great victory for us, and that uh, was fun to see. The next one, Panini Kinza defeats Betch Kahea. Kahea is outstruck 2-1. to one. Uh, He's outboxed, and just sort of is what it is. Uh, the last two here, Ramazan, uh, Ramazan Emiv defeats Nicholas Stoles. Uh, this one we got correct. Uh, Emiv is outstruck slightly, uh, 29 to 30, uh, but scores four takedowns and does some good work on the ground to pick up unanimous decision. And then the last one here, Nathaniel Wood throws 131 strikes to 55, scores the takedown, and picks up unanimous decision victory uh, to round things out for us. So really strong at the end there. You know, we go five straight. In fact, when I started the card, I was like, oh, man, I'm running the table here tonight. Things look good, although... 15 fights i knew i was gonna lose one just statistically and then we ended up settling at nine and six and not my finest work but uh, definitely solid nevertheless you know these uh, fights are difficult to call uh and you know anything can happen you catch a knee stomp in the second round and you know it looks like uh, your next round to win ends up going very differently uh as we can see with darren till so anyways is what it is let's move on to next week though here's the fight picks all right so we have a much shorter card this week only 11 fights and we're starting out with the main event which is going to be Derek brunson versus edmund shabazian uh shabazian is a phenomenal talent right now this kid is a true wonder of a prospect he's fighting top tier opponents not that Derek Brunson is going to be fighting for a title anytime soon, uh, but he's a solid, solid competitor, nevertheless, with two victories in a row uh, going up against this highlight of a product. Uh, but we do have to know Brunson is a little bit advanced in age. Uh, he's uh, about 36 years old, and so, you know, father time catches up with us all. And that's why I ultimately am going to go here with Shabazian. Now, Brunson's got about twice as more fight, twice more fights uh, in his career than Shabazzian does, but Shabazzian just looks so good. His striking, his takedowns, you know, will be interesting if Brunson's able to nullify the takedowns because he has a 100% takedown defense over his UFC career. So uh, that will be very interesting to see how it plays out. But Shabazzian's striking is so good. Uh, his takedowns appear to be really good uh, that I think he has a clear-cut pathway to victory, and I expect him to pick up a solid win over Brunson. Uh, if Brunson is a southpaw, so we will see how Shabazian does deal with that. Also, Brunson has a solid three-inch reach advantage, uh, but we've just seen Shabazian be so dynamic, um, just have so many tools in his toolkit. They're all sharp. He moves really well. He's a good-sized frame for this division. Um, there's really nothing bad to say about this guy at this point in his career. He's taken on all comers. Uh, he's fought very well, and I don't I don't think that uh, taking on Derek Brunson 
will be, well, it'll be a challenge, but I don't think we'll see him challenged, if you know what I mean. I think we're going to see uh, not a war, but we're going to see kind of a one-sided affair, and I think things are going to be in cruise control for Shabazi and for most of the fight. We'll see how things play out, though. If he's not able to score on those takedowns and that kind of uh, you know derails the striking a little bit, Brunson does have a shot, but I'm going to still stick with Shabazi in here. He is the pick in the main event. All right, moving on to the next one here. We got JoJo Calderwood taking on Jennifer Maya. And in this one here, Calderwood probably should be fighting for a title. She was supposed to fight Shevchenko before her injury. I'm not sure what that injury was, and I'm not going to stop here to look it up. But either way, JoJo is not fighting for the title. She's taking on Jennifer Maya. And in this one, I think JoJo picks up the victory here. Uh, JoJo has shown that she has really, really amazing striking. Uh, she has really good, solid takedowns. She's really able to do it all. She's a very well-rounded competitor. And I think Maya here is primarily going to be a stand-up fighter in this situation. Uh, that's what she's really shown herself to do. And so having the additional pathways to victory, being able to disturb the striking through takedowns, I think we got to give it to Calderwood here. Um, both of them, their last losses were to Shikagian, so Shikagian might be uh, the better fighter between the two of them. However, uh, we saw Calderwood come back, pick up a solid win against Lee, and then, you know, this is the second fight for um, Maya. I'm sorry, first fight for Maya since her loss to Kagan. Uh, so she hasn't had a chance to, uh, you know, redeem herself at this point. And I don't think she honestly will. I think she's going to run into a problem with JoJo Calderwood, who has the larger frame, small reach advantage, and just looks phenomenal right now. Uh, so we'll see how things play out in this contest. We are going with JoJo Calderwood to pick up a win in this women's flyweight matchup. All right, this is kind of a dark horse fight. I'm not sure a lot of people are talking about it, but we got Vincente Luque, the silent assassin, taking on Randy Rudeboy Brown. And in this one, I'm sure you think, you know, I'm going to go with Luque here, but I'm going to go with the Rudeboy Brown. He is looking really, really good recently. Not that Luque is looking bad, though. He's got wins over Nico Price. He did lose to Steven Thompson. He also wins over Mike Perry. Some really high-level talents, uh, whereas we only got a two-fight winning streak here. Uh, for Randy Brown, who defeated Alves and Barbarina in his last two outings here. Uh, I think the size advantage is going to lend, though, to Rude Boy Brown. Um, the striking, though, the striking, that's where I sort of question this pick here a little bit. Luke striking is really, really solid. Um, he's able to deal with, you know, reach disadvantages. We've seen it happen in the past. Um, but I think that, honestly, uh, Randy Brown is going to be able to get it done here. I think he's a better power puncher. I think he could potentially score a KO against Luke. We'll see how things play out, though. These guys are really competitive against one another. I just got to go with the rude boy Brown in this contest. All right, we got a hella fun fight here because we got Groovy Lando Venata taking on King Bobby Green. I'll cut the chase real quick on this one. We got Venata as the pick. He redeemed himself with his win against Madeiras. Uh, we also have um, Bobby Green coming off a win against Clay Guida. But I think Venata is going to be able to hang 10 again. I think he's going to be able to pick up a solid win. I mean, this guy hasn't been able to string two wins together in a long, long time. And I think he's finally due. I think Venata is finally here uh, to make a statement in the UFC. And I think he's no longer going to be a punching bag for some guys like Jay Casey and Jakar Close. He's finally established. He's a little bit older, a little bit more experienced. And I think he's going to be able to defeat Bobby Green, who does look good nevertheless. Um, but still, I think Venata gets it done. So we are going to Lando Guru Venata in this lightweight matchup. All right, the next one here, we're going to be a middleweight. We have Kevin Holland versus Trevin Giles. And in this one, I got to go with Holland. It's really hard to overlook that seven-inch reach advantage and those really, really good striking talents, uh, especially when you consider the fact that both these guys are very similar when it comes to the takedown game with Holland maybe having a slight edge in the submissions. Uh, but overall, he's stand behind the jab, move around well enough. He's going to keep Trevin Giles off of him, and I think that's going to nullify any potential takedowns, any potential clinch work. And I see Holland being able to hit Giles at range very easily using that jab, using that size and reach advantage. In this one, I think we got to give it to Kevin Holland. He's the pick in Vegas. All right, this next one here has a, um, I don't know about a legend, but we have an older gentleman, Frankie Sanez, taking on Jonathan Martinez. Uh, so Sanez is 14 years the senior to Martinez, who I think uh, is going to have a bit of a problem with the young talent here. Uh, Martinez's striking is really, really solid. And we know that Sanez, you know, 
his striking has been decent, but this guy's got a lot of miles on him. Maybe not in terms of fights. You know, he's only 13 and 6 despite his, you know, advanced age. Uh, but I think, honestly, he's going to be outdone by the younger man. I think Martinez, he, despite his last loss to Uhl, uh did look really good with wins against Buren and Pinyong Yang. Uh, whereas, you know, we just haven't seen as much out of Frankie recently. You know, his last fight was, well, you know, it actually was in March 23rd of 2019, and then before that, 2018. He basically has fallen off as far as activity, and I think that could potentially hurt him a bit here. Uh, I see him picking up an L. So we are going with the Dragon, Jonathan Martinez, to pick up a win in Las Vegas. All right, we have another guy getting back in the octagon after a uh, loss just recently. We have... Ed Herman taking on GM3, Gerald Mearshart, or Short Fuse Herman, as he's also called. Both these guys are a little bit older MMA vets. We have uh, Herman coming in at uh, 39, but he'll be 40 very soon. And in this one, I think it's really going to come down to, can Gerald get it to the ground? Can he show that he has better jiu-jitsu? Um, these guys look fairly even on the feet, although Herman has a great background as far as submissions, too. Solid takedown game. These guys are very, very even. I just think after that loss to Heinich, GM3 is going to want to get out there, pick up a win, and uh, just get back to his, you know, kind of winning ways. This guy was on a kind of hot streak for a little while. Um, well, I guess it's actually been win-loss, win-loss for a bit. So I look here at his record. I think he's better than he is, maybe, is probably part of the problem. Uh, but the numbers are telling me that it's going to be Gerald Mearsart, so we're going to stick with him in this one. Uh, but just know these guys are fairly, fairly close here. Uh, so we'll have to see how things go out. Although, it uh, looks like your shot is going up to 205. That's uh, that's sort of something else to take into consideration that uh, the numbers do not give me a guide on for that. So uh, that's clever. We'll see how things uh, play out there. Uh, I'm kind of curious now how he'll do at 205. All right. Well, stay tuned on that one. Take it with a grain of salt. All right, the next one here, we're going to have a debut bout for Ray. Well, Ray Bork will not be the debuter, of course. But he's taking on Nick Maines, or uh, the Mayhem Maines. And in this one here, I got to go with the debuter here just because we have Borg fighting again at a bantam weight division because he cannot make weight at 125 pounds. And the problem is, Mains is 5'10 with 72 inches of reach over Borg 63. Take that into consideration. A nine inch reach advantage over Ray Borg. And he's 11 and 1. He looks like a really solid talent coming in. I know Borg is an animal down at the smaller weight class, the 125 pound division, but 135, he's a really small guy. And I think he's going to have a problem with these guys that are so big, that are so adept at cutting weight and uh, using them big frames. And I think Nate is going to be no exception here. I think he defeats Ray Borg. And uh, we'll see how things play out, though. Uh, but we got to go with Nate Maines, the mayhem in this contest. All right, the next one here, we have Eric Spicely taking Marcus Perez. And this one, uh, just keep this in mind, I just read this on Twitter recently. Uh, Spicely's team could make it out to Vegas. So he was actually putting on Twitter that he needed a training partner to get some work in. Eh, not not the best thing I want to see going in, but that's okay because the numbers picked Perez anyways. Uh, so Perez, I mean, well, these guys match up very evenly. Um, seems like the striking could be a slight advantage to Spicely. Uh, but I still like Perez here. He's proven himself to be very good at uh, getting wins, whereas, well, good might be an overstatement, uh, but he's getting more than we can say for Spicely. He was on a four-fight losing streak, and I don't like his odds when his team can't make it. He's looking for a training partner. He's going to lack a lot of discipline this week. The weight cut, I imagine, could be hard, and I don't want to get too down on the guy. He is fighting at least in middleweight, so hopefully you know, he doesn't have too much weight to cut, but uh, things could be difficult for him. Hopefully he gets over to the PI, see how he does. Uh, but I got to go with Perez in this one. I think despite the fact they match it very equally, slight edge goes to Perez, and he is the pick in this contest. Then in the next one here, the last one, uh, no, actually, we got two more fights. One of them was added just recently. Uh, we got Jamal Emmers and Timur Valiev. In this one, it's a debut fight for Valiev. In this one, though, I'm going to go with Valiev. He looks like a really hot product coming in, and uh, I think he'll uh, be able to make work of Jamal Emmers, who picked up a loss in his first UFC outing against Giga Chickadees. Uh, so, be on the lookout for Valiev to take to pick up a win. All right, and then in the last fight here, we have Chris Gutierrez taking on Cody Durden. And this one here, I just crunched it up real fast here, and it looks like yeah, we're going to have a bantamweight fight. So it looks like Gutierrez is going down from his normal weight class. Uh, and uh, this one's a little tough because we don't have much going on Durden, but he does train over with Douglas Lima, who fights over in Bellator, and I believe is their Bellator champion. Uh, so I I like the, uh, you know, I like 
the American top team Atlanta product, and I think that he should do well against Chris Gutierrez. That is a, a debut fight, though, so we'll see how things play out, but I'm going to go with Cody Duran in that contest. So let's go over them one more time here. We got Shabazian, Calderwood, Brown, Venata, Holland, Martinez, Mearshart, Perez, Maines, Valiave, and now just added Durden to round things out. Uh, so we're back in Vegas, uh, first time in a long while, and uh, we got a pretty solid card here. I think our performance is going to be pretty darn good. Um, I am looking forward to watching this one. We got some other ones starting to percolate as well. We got Miocic Cormier 3 coming on the 15th, and uh, that's kind of it for right now. So we'll see how things go out. There's a lot of you know, a lot of talk about September. Um, will Khabib be fighting? And at this point, it seems probably not due to the loss of his father and his you know, time to grieve. Uh, but there are potentially some other firefights out there. And uh, while there aren't as many to talk about right now, I know the UFC is hard at work putting them together. Fight picking for them, or matchmaking rather, takes place on Tuesday. So hopefully tomorrow, after the time you're listening to this, you're able to give that a listen or a... Well, you wouldn't like to actually listen to matchmaking, would you? Anyways, you'll be able to see those, and we'll have more fights to talk about in the near future. Uh, but we're looking at this Miocic 3 card. Very solid outing. Uh, so obviously, Miocic Cormier. Got the trilogy, the rubber match, if you will. Solid fight. co Junior Dos Santos, Jahirza Roizenstruck. Excellent, excellent fight. Uh, Dos Santos is looking amazing lately, physically. Roizenstruck, obviously, was looking good up until he ran into Nganu. That's going to be an interesting fight. Uh, just offhand, I like Dos Santos. He's a very technical boxer. I think he can make good work out of Jairzinho. Uh Then we have Maga, uh, yeah, Magomed Ankalev take on I, uh, Ion Kudalaba. Uh, and that one, you know, hard to say. I, I think Kudalaba was kind of just fainting industry. Uh, industry injury in the uh, first fight, so we'll run that one back, see how it goes. Pedro Munoz, Frankie Edgar, bantamweight, excellent, excellent fight, bantamweight debut for Frankie Edgar, very excited for that one. And then Sean O'Malley coming back to fight Marlon Cheeto Vera, again, solid fight, great fight for Sean O'Malley. We'll see how that one plays out. Uh, that guy is obviously riding high after his last win and, and just the way he fights in the Sugar Show, you know how it is. All right, so I'll be back with a retrospective because we're going to have at least one week off after this contest here. Let's take a look at the calendar real quick. Yeah, so there's going to be no fighting on the 8th. We'll come back to the 15th, so we will do a retrospective after this contest, and then we'll you know do a little hold off, and then we will get some fight picks out to you very soon. So until I speak with you again, happy fight picking.